In the early part of my career as a park ranger, I worked in southern Alabama. I was an environmental specialist and we were looking at stoneflies in the coastal areas of the state. It required a lot of sampling out in the streams. When I went sampling, I'd have to get into the stream and collect five packets of leaves that collected in the stream at random intervals in a hundred yard stretch of the stream. The project went on for about a year. I would park my truck by the side of the road near a bridge and climb down and hop in the stream and go to work. Some of these streams were way out in the woods and quite remote. At the beginning of my field work in the summer, it was easy to get a partner to coordinate with me. It made the work easier and safer. But late in the fall, the seasonal workers would dwindle down so I started sampling by myself in later November and early December. It added some extra time on my day, but it made scheduling easier and more consistent. Nothing dangerous had happened going solo, so I was okay with the change. That's how it was through the winter and early spring. It was sometime in early March that I was traveling to the second stream of the day. It was a stream that I'd seen twice a month for the last seven or eight months. I knew it like the back of my hand, and I thought I had seen everything it had to offer. I arrived there around 10 a.m. This stream had a nice clearing off the side of the road. It was about a 30 yard or so walk to the stream with a slight decline over this eroded dirt and gravel, so I couldn't see the other side of the stream. I rolled up my chest waders and walked to the back of the truck to pack up my gear. I grabbed my super sampler, a fine mesh net that attaches to this folding base, and my metal stick meter. I walked down to the stream ready to get in when across the stream I spotted something with this grayish brown fur. That's when I heard this low growling sound. My first thought was that it was an off-leash dog who had gotten away from its owner. I stopped at my tracks, staring right at it, waiting to see if its owner would show up from the woods. I heard this crazy sounding howl, and then it ran off a ways into the woods. But then I saw it stop and look back at me. It was well hidden in the trees, but I could tell that it was standing there staring at me. It seemed to have a huge amount of fur around its neck. I wasn't making any noise at that point. The stream bank was relatively high up from the water, about two or three yards. I was on the side with a small steep entrance. I figured I could get my work done and the dog would just leave me alone. I climbed down and whenever I checked, it didn't seem to be coming closer to the edge. I made it to my first sampling spot about 20 yards into the stream. I couldn't believe the longest sampling for the day had to have a wild dog appearance. I figured I was fine to start walking upstream, but the further I went, the less comfortable I felt. This animal wasn't frolicking around like you might expect a dog to do. It was hunched over, hiding behind the trees and foliage like it was trying to conceal itself. It had become dead silent. I couldn't hear it move over the sound of the stream. That's when I started getting really spooked. But I had four more areas to sample. As I kept going, I was walking slower than usual in the shifting sands and rushing water to make sure that I didn't lose my footing. I started to move closer to the opposite bank. That's when I started smelling something horrible. I mean, it did smell like a wet dog but it was mixed with this stench of rotting flesh and garbage. I felt its eyes on me, and when I spotted it again, I swear to you, it had stood up on its back legs and was taller than me, like approaching seven feet tall. That's when I started hearing that low growl sound again. I started backing away downstream, and it came further out from behind the trees. It made eye contact with me, and I saw that the eyes appeared yellow, and the face looked demonic. Now that it wasn't hiding, I could see that the upper part of the body was just massive. I could see fangs and I was petrified with fear, but I made myself keep backing away slowly, back to the spot where I could climb up the bank. It felt like it took an eternity. When I got there, 
I felt a wave of relief since I could now climb up and was within sight of my truck. The creature had advanced closer to the edge of the stream bank. I just kept facing it while backing my way up to the truck. Once I reached my vehicle, I threw in my stuff in the back and I got in behind the wheel and left without completing the job. I described the encounter to my supervisor. He seemed completely baffled and had no idea what it could have been. They sent a unit to search the area but didn't come up with anything. I had to return to that stream about eight more times, but I made sure I was armed. But I never saw it again. I was working as a park ranger in the Shoshone National Forest. If you don't know, that's grizzly country, and we make a massive effort to practice bear safety in our area. This involves educating visitors at the ranger stations, providing bear lockers and public campsites and monitoring bear activity in the area. One of the precautions that we take very seriously is to temporarily close trails where there have been reported bear activity. Most often, this is because a sow and cubs frequent the area or there have been reports of a carcass nearby. If there are any reports of animal carcasses, we shut down that trail immediately. Bears can be extremely protective of their food and have been known to kill humans who get too close. So when I received a report from a backpacking group about a carcass along one of our trails, I set out straight away to close the area. The backpackers didn't actually see the carcass, but they smelled it and got out of the area as quickly as they could. This was a good choice on their part or else they could have been in some real trouble. I didn't know just how much trouble until much later. I put out a public notice that the area was closed and put up barricades around the trailheads with the notice that it was temporarily closed due to bear activity. I took one of our ATVs out there to investigate the area just to make sure that it was indeed an animal carcass. While rare, bear attacks on people do occur and because they hadn't seen the carcass, I wanted to check it out. When I got to the area the backpackers described, I smelled the strongest decomposing smell I have ever smelled in my life. Think bloated roadkill in the sun, but a thousand times worse. I honestly didn't know something could smell so bad. The strange part was that I searched everywhere and I couldn't find the source. Bears do typically cache their food, but they're not very good at it. If you find a bear cache, it's probably only half buried, if that. The smell was coming from everywhere. The carcass was definitely in this area, but I couldn't find it. The only thing I found were deer tracks in the dirt. I spent another hour out there before I gave up, and I went back to the ranger station. I didn't think much of it until I got another call two days later about a carcass on a different trail about eight miles away from the area I had closed earlier in the week. This report came from a day hiker who said they saw a deer carcass lying in the meadow about 20 yards away from the trail. They said they saw its antlers sticking up from the grass and when they went to investigate, they found a rotting carcass. The skull was stripped bare but there was fur and meat on the rest of the animal and it smelled ungodly. The hiker said they didn't see any signs of predators around, but something had definitely been eating it. I thanked the hiker for calling and headed out to close the area. I took the ATV again up the trail to see exactly where the carcass was. The hiker had described the location for me, and I thought I knew exactly where it would be, but I couldn't find anything when I got there. I searched the meadow and saw no antlers sticking out but I did find a deer bed. The grasses were batted down, and it was about the same area that the hiker said the carcass was. I felt the grass, and it was still warm, and there was a bit of blood in the grass. I couldn't believe it. From what the hiker described, there was no way this animal could be alive. He said the skin from the skull was gone, and it had been partially eaten. I searched the area for a critically injured deer, I searched the meadow and the surrounding forest with no success. 
I figured it must have found a quiet place to die and hoped it wasn't suffering, but there wasn't much else I could do. I headed back to my ATV and then, out of nowhere, I smelled the stench of rotting flesh. It was the same exact smell that I encountered two days prior on the other trail. And then, I saw it. The deer. It was standing right in front of my ATV on the trail. It looked like a zombie. The hiker was dead right. It had no skin on its face. It was just a skull, and I didn't see any eyes. Part of its flesh were exposed along its ribs and flank. I honestly couldn't believe the creature was standing. I walked toward it, drawing my gun. That's when I knew that I wasn't looking at a sick and injured deer. This was some sort of evil creature. I fired a shot right into its chest. It didn't even flinch. I expected it to drop a second later, but it just stood there. I half expected it to attack me at that point, but it didn't. For whatever reason, I have no idea. I slowly got into my ATV and turned the key. The creature didn't move at all. It just stood there like it was staring at me, but it had no eyes. I think that was the worst part. I could see the bullet wound I had given it just seconds before, but there was no blood pouring out. Nothing. Just a tiny hole in its matted hair. I really can't explain how terrified I was at that point. I knew this thing was the source of the stench on the other trail too. I had been able to travel 8 miles in rough terrain to get here. I had no idea if it would try to follow me out. I hoped it wasn't faster than my ATV. I put the ATV in reverse and backed up far enough to give this thing a wide berth and I drove out of there as fast as I could. I looked behind me once and that creature had turned around to watch me, but it didn't follow me. I closed the area for the rest of the year and it seemed like the creature just disappeared after that. Hopefully it died, but I have a feeling that it didn't and that it's still out there somewhere deep in the wilderness. I was out collecting water and soil samples in a swamp in South Carolina. I don't remember which one because I visited like five or six that day, and this happened a few years ago. I want to say it was scape or swamp, but it might have been polk swamp. I was collecting water samples because we were testing for pollutants in the water and soil health across various wetlands. I'm a wetland biologist, so this is something I do frequently. In fact, I'm sure I've been to that location before, but it's hard to know for certain. In any case, I had my soil corer out and began to scope out a good area. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary at the time. Once I found a spot where the ground was soft, I began to kick away and clear debris and sticks and such. At the time, it was humid out, and I remember it was getting hot. It was cloudy and overcast, and I remember thinking I was grateful it wasn't sunny. I took a few samples, cleaned up my tools, and began to scope out another spot. You could hear the distant chirping of the birds and the grasshoppers jumping around. The air was still and it was horribly muggy. As I was walking, I heard something snap behind me in the brush. I turned around, but I didn't see anything. I just thought it was a grasshopper jumping or something, so I went on my way. I heard the snap again, and I froze. I stared into the brush. I don't know what I hoped to see or if I wanted to see anything at all but I stood and stared. I thought I heard someone breathing, and I listened closely. Out in the wetlands, there are a lot of dangerous animals out there, and I was worried there was a bobcat hiding in the brush. I began clapping and yelling, hoping to scare away whatever was in the brush, and stepped back slowly. Nothing emerged from the brush, but I was left a little shaken. I needed to find some water to collect my samples. I was really worried about the wildlife now. I knelt down by some water and put on all my safety gear. You have to be careful near water because you have crocodiles that lurk in the waters and occasionally the brush areas too. I looked around and it seemed clear, so I began to collect my samples. I had gathered a couple when I heard the snap in the brush behind me. I turned around, the hair on my neck starting to rise. I heard what sounded like a low, deep growl. My heart stopped. 
My hands shook as I clapped them together and slowly rose to my feet. I began to yell and shout, hoping to scare away whatever was stalking me. Through the gaps in the foliage, I saw a pair of yellow snake-like eyes. I thought I was dealing with a crocodile and began looking for my escape route. I thought maybe I had impeded on its territory. Then it slowly began to rise. My blood ran cold as I watched in horror as the monster emerged from the brush. It looked like a cross between a man and a reptile. It was easily eight feet tall. Its yellow eyes were emotionless and cunning, and its head was outright terrifying. Its body was human enough, it had arms, legs, fingers, and toes, but its head looked like a lizard head. It had huge, sharp teeth, slanted nostrils, and its tongue flicked in and out like a snake. It raised its arms, revealing huge black talons and parted the shrubbery. It let loose another low, deep growl as it slowly approached me. I stumbled back and fell to the ground. Somehow I found the strength to stand, and I ran as fast as I could. I didn't know where I was going. I only knew that if it caught me, I'd be dead. I tore through the brush, sticks and stiff leaves cutting my legs. I looked over my shoulder and it was behind me, getting closer with every step. I wasn't watching where I was going and I tripped over a log sticking out of the ground. I fell and landed on my arm wrong, instantly breaking it. I scooted away trying to catch enough footing to stand again, but the monster had caught up to me. It got to the ground and began to crawl towards me, slowly on all fours, moving like a crocodile or a lizard might. It growled, and I swear I could feel it vibrating in my chest. I was screaming for help, though I knew nobody would hear me. It reached out and grabbed my leg. I screamed and kicked it in the face. It hissed and sunk its talons into my leg. I kept kicking it. If I was going to die, I wouldn't go out without a fight. I kept kicking it until it released my leg to grab my foot. When it did, I grabbed a rock and bashed it on the head. It released me with a startled hiss, and I stood and ran once more. I ran as fast as I could manage. Blood was pouring down my leg, and I cradled my arm as I ran. I don't know how I managed to do this because I was in a lot of pain, but I did. I looked behind me, and it was still chasing me. It bared its teeth as it ran at inhumane speeds. I stumbled as I broke through the brush, escaping onto the road. I watched as it stopped at the edge of the road, growling in anger as it sulked back into the brush. I have some nasty scars now, and I lost my equipment and my job. But I'm just so grateful I was able to escape with my life. I'm a park ranger in the Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. As a park ranger, especially way out here, you spend a fair amount of time alone and isolated from civilization. You also see and hear many strange things out in the wild. Most of the time, however, they're explainable. A rare animal, a wayward hiker, or even just the wind. But none of these explain what I saw a few weeks ago. I had been caught out to one of the park's more remote areas. There had allegedly been several sightings of a mountain lion, and a newly married couple even claimed that they were stalked by the animal. My superiors just wanted me to head out and see if I found any evidence of the lion's presence. If I did, I was to radio back to HQ so that the team could be sent out to relocate it. Mountain lions in the park certainly aren't common, but they aren't unheard of either. I was pretty skeptical myself. I had only caught glimpses of them twice in my seven year tenure, and neither time was anywhere near a hiking trail. But duty called so I headed out to the area where the claims were coming from, on what I thought would be a fruitless search. I really wish it had been. The first area I checked out was a clearing parked alongside one of the smaller streams flowing out from the mountains. Camping was prohibited here but I saw obvious signs of a campfire and a small stack of firewood. The man who had made the report conveniently left this detail out of his accounting. 
I wasn't much of a tracker and I couldn't see any evident signs of the animals passing, but I did have to admit that the area presented a likely spot for a predator's ambush. The trees on the edge of the clearing were packed in tight, providing lots of concealment, and two different game trails led through the thick woods towards the stream. I headed towards the second destination, where the couple had their sighting. It was about a three hour hike from where I was. I couldn't use a vehicle along the narrow trail, and about halfway in, I began to feel, rather than see, something just past the edge of my vision. Glimpses of movement or quick flashes of something brown. I started to get a little nervous at this point. Cougars are unrivaled masters of the ambush in North America, and if there was really one out here, I would have a real hell of a time spotting it through the dense brush. I told myself that the movement I had seen was probably an elk or a deer and just kept going. Another 20 minutes later, I was proven wrong. Sixth sense, divine intervention, instinct, call it what you want. I was mid-stride when an alarm went off in my head, screaming for me to duck, and I did. Just as I hit the ground, I felt something go soaring over the top of my head, and then I heard it hit the ground a few feet away. I scrambled to my feet and went to reach for my service pistol when I was struck frozen in abject awe and terror. I know how this next part is going to sound, I really do, and I wouldn't believe me either, but I was there and I saw what I saw, crouched a dozen paces away like it was straight out of a fifth grade textbook was a saber-toothed tiger. It was wheeling back around after its landing, and it stopped completely when it saw my face. It was panting, and a long sliver of drool dropped to the ground from the six-inch tusk along the side of its mouth. Even in a state of shock, the survivor in me sized the thing up, and it must have been nearly 700 pounds. If that thing got on top of me, I was dead dead out here alone in the wilderness, slaughtered by a creature that's been extinct for I don't even know how many thousands of years. We both stood frozen, eyes locked onto one another. I think I completely stopped breathing, and I was vaguely aware of my hand on the holster of my weapon. I imagined the stench of fear washing over me and coalescing into a tangible cloud to be wafted up by the prehistoric nightmare in front of me. It placed one thick padded paw forward and broke the trance. Like an old west gunfighter, I ripped my pistol out of its holder and banged out two wild shots in the creature's direction. I hadn't aimed and was never a good shot anyway. And both shots went way wide of the creature, but it was enough to scare it off. It was gone in a flash, off into the brush alongside the game trail. Without a second thought, I turned and ran as fast as I could the way I had come. I can't remember exactly when, but at some point, my bag caught on a tree limb and still panicking, ripped it off my shoulder, leaving the bag behind. Water, radio, and food were all left behind me. I noticed about 15 minutes later when my lungs felt like they were going to burst and had to stop to rest. After recovering, I took stock of my situation. I was alone in the park hours away from help, with no way to call for it, and an apex predator somewhere in the vicinity. I was coming to realize just how screwed I was, when a guttural roar nearby drove the point home even further. I started running again. The next few hours were horrific. It petrifies me to even think about it, let alone put it all down on paper. In short, this creature stalked me for three hours. Twice more it came to attack, and twice more my gunshots drove it away. When I had finally got close to where my vehicle was parked, I made a dash, with the last few pieces of ammo shot off at intervals to help keep the creature at bay. It worked, and I made it back into the truck without so much as another glimpse of the thing. You can imagine how my report went. I've been restricted to what amounts to death duty, surrendering my service pistol, and I'm starting mandatory therapy next week. After what I experienced that day in the mountains, maybe I need it.
When my mom died, I had to drive from where I was working in Chula Vista, California, all the way to Benson, Arizona, to help my dad. My sisters would fly into Tucson the next day, and it was on me to pick them up and keep things moving. I got the call around 6, so I knew if I left right then, I wouldn't get there until well after midnight. But I didn't want to sleep in my own bed, and I hated the idea of having dad be on his own so I threw a bag together and hit the road. Thankfully, once you're on I-8, it's a pretty straight shot, so I could just turn my brain off. It was dark by the time I crossed the border and hit Yuma, and the stress of it had me fatigued. To keep from getting too sleepy, I turned on the radio and tried to find something I could sing along to. Past Yuma is pretty much straight up desert for something like 200 miles. Thankfully, the road is straight, so I could pretty much just let my mind wander. It was a weeknight, and after I cleared the suburbs, there was hardly anybody on the road. At one point, I drove over 10 miles without seeing a single set of headlights. After the better part of an hour, the radio started getting glitchy. Reception can be rough out here, so when it went full-on static, I didn't think much of it and switched it off. My phone on the dash was giving me directions and it started going crazy too. It kept saying, recalculate it, then proceed to the route, then would cycle back over again. Whenever it seemed like it was about to grab onto a signal, it would jump back to square one. I was staring at it, trying to figure out what the problem was. Then it just went dead. It's not like I needed the directions right then, but I couldn't help messing with my phone. So I unplugged it and I pulled it out of the stand it wouldn't turn on. Whatever loop it had gotten caught in bricked it. I kid you not, within five miles, a whole line of headlights sprang up out of the dark. They came up from the opposite direction, and when they got closer, I could see that they were taking up both lanes of traffic. Not wanting to get hit, I flipped on my brights so they would know for sure I was there. They didn't get out of the lane though. To make things even more interesting, my car started to sputter and the dash lights kept dimming and surging. With no other choice, I pulled off the shoulder as fast as I could, without going down into a gully. Almost as soon as I put it in park, my car's electrical system went dead just like my phone. Within a minute, this massive caravan of cars came up and rolled to a stop. There had to be over 30 trucks traveling in a pack. Everyone was a military vehicle with all the lights. One of the trucks in the front pulled nose to nose with me and two soldiers got out, shining their flashlights right into my car. They came up on either side of my car and one of them knocked on my hood and called me to get out. I didn't want to, but they made it pretty clear that if I didn't get out on my own, they would pull me out. Once I was standing with them, they asked me about my phone, cameras, or any other electronics. I told them that mine were dead and they demanded that I handed it over. I got out of the car and they checked it over. Then one of them leaned back over his shoulder and waved for the line to keep moving. Everything started up at once, and the noise was shocking. Truck after truck rolled by, each one filled with soldiers eyeing me up. In the middle of everything was this massive flatbed truck, loaded down with something that extended almost to either edge of the highway. It was roughly covered with a tarp, but it was very clearly circular. The parts of it that I could see were smooth metal. I would have looked harder, but the two soldiers kept staring at me, making it clear that I shouldn't look too hard. Right behind this wide load, there were three trucks carrying boxy units on the back. They looked almost like refrigeration trucks, but with all kinds of pipes and panels covering them. The back loading doors were secured with heavy padlocks, and an armed soldier hung off the back of each. At last, the whole thing moved past me, and the two guys watching me got into action. One handed me my phone and made it clear that I should get moving. They climbed into their truck and sped off down the shoulder, I guess to get back in front of the line. I got back into my car and sat there for a little while trying to sort out what I had just seen. After a bit, my phone screen lit up, like nothing had happened. Taking that as a sign, I turned the key and my car started up like normal. It was well after 2 in the morning when I got to my dad's place. 
and I just went to bed and tried to sleep. He had so much on his plate, I never told him about the crazy military escort I had seen the night before. A couple of times, I almost convinced myself that I had dreamed the whole thing. Then I had been so tired and emotionally drained that I nodded off and woke up on the shoulder. Maybe I did. But I remember the situation far too clearly for it all to be just a dream. As a kid, I spent quite a lot of time outdoors. I grew up around the salt marshes of South Carolina. There's a pretty unique culture around there. There's a lot of belief in magic, kind of dark magic, and lots of spiritualism. So I'm used to weird stories, but I never tended to give that much attention. Most everyone who spent enough time there has their own spooky story, but this is one of mine that I never believed I would experience. When I first became a ranger, I didn't want to move too far away from home. I got a position at a state park at the bottom of South Carolina. Over a period of couple weeks, we had started getting reports from campers of hearing these weird high-pitched screeching noises. And weirdly, people were complaining of moss. Our coastline were having problems with these invasive tallow trees. And I think the government had released some insects, including moths, to eat the seeds for prevention purposes. In any case, I had been increasing my patrols, trying to keep an eye on everything. This one day when I was out, the woods just felt odd. They felt strangely alive for some reason. I don't really know how to explain it. Everything looked the same, but my surroundings seemed to be luring me in. I know it sounds crazy, but... I was kind of used to general strangeness of that area and didn't know any different. But when I started hearing that high-pitched noise, it was definitely something new to me. There was this weird urgency to it. I followed the sound through the woods. I didn't notice any specific bird or animal that could be making that noise. But I found a strange path where the vines had been bent and formed into this bizarre shape. There was this folklore around there that referred to the sigils. Supposedly, these occult signs which represent various angels and demons are used to summon people towards a bad end. Whatever these shapes were, they were really unnatural looking and gave me this really creepy feeling. But since I didn't believe in such things, I followed the path marked with these symbols through the woods. I came to a small circular clearing around a huge tree. The tree was probably about five feet in diameter, and the clearing around it was probably around and the clearing around it was three feet around, with the ring of smaller trees making a wall or a fence around the tree in the clearing. I still remember how odd that formation was of all those trees. I thought it was cool though. I remember the longer I followed the sound, the stranger I felt. I have never felt quite the same feeling. My gut would have preferred that I turned around and go back, but honestly, that was what pushed me forward even more. I wanted to know what must be so terrible that my instincts were so persistently pulling me against the direction I was traveling in. So I walked around the clearing surrounding this big tree a few times. I noticed a smaller path leading out of the tree ring area. The path was narrow, and though definitely beaten into the ground, it was overgrown with thorns. I'll never forget the feeling I got as I approached this overgrown path. It felt like my insides were begging me not to continue forward. So of course, I did. I used my walking stick to push the brambles out of my way. I followed this tiny path. It was pretty short and oddly dark, as if the ground had been burnt. The path turned a corner and I saw this small area just a small like five by five spot of woods that was all burnt. There was a tree in front of me. It was charred and about a foot in diameter. The top half of the tree was all burnt up. I swore I could hear some low mumbling. The next second, I heard a loud crash coming from my left on the small trail I had come off of. I just dropped to the ground. As I was laying there, I saw a silhouette coming up from the path. It kind of had the outline of feathers on it, and it was ungodly tall and humanoid, but sickly thin. It was going from tree to tree not very far from me, and was looking all around. 
snapping its head back and forth and making this low mumbling sound as it moved. Then it lifted its head up and broke out into that screeching sound. I saw its face. It seemed to have no features with these horrible red eyes. By this time, I was lying flat on the ground in the tall grasses. I watched as it spread these incredibly leathery wings and shot off down the path faster than anything I've ever seen. That's the moment that I will never, ever forget. The moment was so quick. I mean it was like in the blink of an eye, but so powerful and striking, it's burned into my mind. It shot off then seemed to lift up into the trees and disappear into the distance. I just ran, not even the way I came. I didn't even care where I ended up, as long as it was away from there. I ended up bursting out of the woods almost into somebody's campsite. I had to immediately tone down my fear and make my way back to the station acting like I was just fine. You can just imagine what my report must have sounded like to my supervisor. All they could really do was get the word out to all the rangers to be on the lookout for an unspecified walking flying creature. I honestly didn't tell anyone else until very recently. That was a few years ago now, and I'm no closer to an explanation than I ever was. Every government institution has secrets. It comes with a territory, right? Once you're entrusted with enough power or enough responsibility, you're bound to come across some information you're not supposed to share. I've been repeating that idea like a mantra lately. Let's say I know something that could be dangerous. Is it my responsibility to share that information? Or is it my responsibility to keep it secret? I don't know the answer, but keeping the experience to myself isn't sustainable anymore. It's driving me crazy. If I never talk about it, I'll never have more than these questions. I want some answers instead. Almost 10 years ago now, the compliance office overseeing Yosemite National Park received an anonymous tip that poachers were in the area. Mariposa Grove was named a specific point of interest. If you don't already know, that's a concentrated area of the sequoia on the southernmost tip of Yosemite. The compliance office isn't usually in charge of filtering information like that. It took a while to trickle down to the right people. Once we had it, I was grouped with a team of rangers asked to monitor the grove. Under circumstances like these, most tips don't pan out. We either hear about the poachers after it's too late, or they realize that we've been tipped off and they never show. I spotted these poachers right away. A few days after I was assigned, I found tracks of an undocumented campsite. That put me on the trail fast. It was another day before I caught up to them. In hindsight, I should have recognized how out of the ordinary this was. The tip went through the wrong office. The park district mobilized immediately. And there I was, closing in on our suspects just a few days later. As much as I hate to say it, we never acted with so much urgency. We weren't always that accurate either. The suspects were a 50-year-old man and his teenager son. They were scared even before I flashed my badge. Those should have been my last red flags. I should have listened to their story. At the time, all I heard was that they were hunting something. They admitted it. I didn't waste time on any details beyond that. They told me that they had already set up a trap in the area too. That needed to be my priority. The sun was setting. I asked them to lead me to the trap anyways. It needed to be disabled before it could do any permanent damage to the local wildlife. They begrudgingly agreed. The boy was particularly resistant. I remember him yelling at the father, almost warning him that something bad would happen if they went along with my demands. If anything, that only made me more persistent. I thought they were trying to avoid additional legal trouble. To me, that meant they were hiding something else. I wanted to see it. We walked for about a mile. When it finally got dark, I contacted my superiors over the radio. If either of the suspects were injured while I was urging them on, the park district would be facing a lawsuit. They agreed with my earlier assessment. We needed to disable the trap and ensure that the poachers weren't hiding anything else. 
I was expecting to find a snare or a live cage. What I found instead was a pit. They had dug a hole large enough to bury an elk. Sharpened stakes were crammed in the bottom, and a cloth sack was suspended from a tree overhead. Red liquid was leaking through the fabric. I turned and questioned the poachers. There were black bears in the area, sure, but they weren't going to be lured into a trap with a bag of raw meat. They weren't going to come running like sharks to blood. Before the father or son could answer me, a roar swept through the trees. It was deep and long-winded, louder than anything I'd heard from a bear. I must have processed the next few events in shock. I don't remember being an active participant in anything that had happened. I only remember the encounter unfolding around me. The sun ran and tackled me to the ground. As he did, a flash of reddish fur leaped over our heads. I saw teeth and spit and fiery eyes. I think I climbed to my feet. I was standing for the next part. The animal charged the father. It was running on two legs. I remember that vividly. Its long arms swayed, almost scraping the ground when it sprinted. The old poacher wasn't fast enough to run away. He must have known that because he headed for the pit instead. He jumped across the opening as the animal lunged for him. I watched its snout-like mouth wrap around his shoulder. Then the two of them fell in the pit together. There was a scream and a whine. I'm not sure where either sound came from, the man or the monster. A team of first responders was in the area within an hour. They airlifted the poacher out of the spike pit and took him to a hospital for treatment. He lived. The animal did not. Whatever that creature was, it was dragged out of that hole under a blue tarp. The body was carried out of the grove on the back of a four-wheeler. I remember its limbs dangling out from underneath the sheet and cutting lines in the dirt. When we got through the trees, they were waiting for us. Another government agency. They gave their credentials to my superiors. When I tried to ask questions, they insisted that I needed more medical attention. I was stuck answering questions while they loaded the tarp and the creature into this large black van. Once they drove away, they told me what I saw. The information was almost clinical. It sounded like they had rehearsed all of their answers. It was a sick bear. The poachers had injured it in a prior exchange, which was why it was moving so strangely. The father and son, they said, were members of a notorious group of illegal hunters. I'd done the park service a great favor, they said. I chose to believe them. I chose to believe them for years. Each night when I couldn't sleep, I chose to believe them. Each morning when I looked at myself in the mirror, I chose to believe them. Now, I'm not so sure. I look for the whereabouts of the boy and his father. They saved my life, right? It's like they don't exist. I asked a few friends of mine who still work for the park service if they could find the records of that incident. There's nothing. Everything behind me has been erased. I was a passenger that night. I was a spectator. I don't want to be a spectator anymore. I want to know what that creature was. I want to know where it was taken and by who. And I want to know why those two poachers were hunting it. I really enjoy hiking. I like finding cool things on the trails. Stones, leaves, mushrooms, little pieces of bark, and even tiny insects and things like that. It helps me clear my mind to do things out in nature. So when the weather is right, or if I start feeling a bit antsy, I'll go for a stroll. It was May when we started to get a lot of rain. It's one of my favorite smells. So I'd usually hold out until I saw clouds in the sky. My friend was supposed to meet up with me that day, but they weren't feeling very well. I didn't want to sit inside, so I decided that I knew the trail enough to go out on my own. I had done it plenty of times before, going on the trail alone, and it would give me more time and space to just let my mind be free. I put on my raincoat and my boots, I grabbed my satchel so I might be able to collect some fun things, and I headed out the door. The trail wasn't a far drive. It was just a few miles from where I lived. I pulled into the parking area. I wanted to make sure that I didn't leave anything important behind. So I checked my back seats and glove compartment. I typically bring a water bottle, a flashlight, and a pocket knife. You know, just in case. 
I grabbed this stuff and a compact umbrella because I had been hoping for rain. I shoved it all into my satchel and I headed onto the path. It had rained the day before, so I could still smell the wet leaves in the dirt. The ground was pretty slippery, but once you get going, you kind of get used to it. This particular trail was known for having lots of wildlife. I had seen plenty of birds, a few snakes, and some squirrels and raccoons, and once I saw a few deer. I hadn't seen anything super threatening, well, other than the snakes. I do hate snakes, but not like a wolf or anything like that. Nobody seemed to be on the trail that day, or the day before. I didn't see any footprints in the mud. To be fair, it was rather early in the morning when I went, maybe earlier than the average person would like to go for a hike. But it didn't deter me at all. I knew the trail, like I said. The clouds were definitely getting more and more dark as I hiked. I could tell that I'd get what I'd asked for. Honestly, looking back at it all, I do regret it. I started to feel tiny raindrops fall into my hair. I took out my umbrella. It wasn't pouring yet, but you could count on it getting to that point in a matter of seconds. So I'm just soaking up the environment and the ambience when I hear this strange sound in the distance. It sort of sounded like a weird high-pitched shrieking sound. So I looked around. I thought maybe it was a deer, but I'm not a wildlife expert. It could have been something else, or it could have been nothing at all. And with the rain that started to pick up, I could have just been hearing normal noises. It was a little muffled, and it sounded a ways away from me. I didn't see anything, so I packed up my water bottle and I just continued walking. My umbrella was up, so the sound of the rain was pretty loud around my head but I kept hearing something moving in the woods off to my right. So I'd stop and I'd look and listen. I was naive, I suppose, too trusting. I just kept brushing it off. The rain is knocking some branches around because that's what it sounded like, branches being disturbed. There was a point when the sounds got more intrusive. I did start to panic a little. Mostly, I had a feeling like the sound was following me, so my mind started creating theories. Was there some stalker person following me? Did they know where I live? I was scared, but I was scared of the wrong thing. I halfway expected to see a creepy person or a bear. That's not what I saw at all. As I'm looking around to identify what is making all of the ruckus, I notice to my right something moving. My focus is entirely on this one particular tree. The trunk of the tree is decently thick, and there's plenty of branches on it. But then I started to realize that some of the branches I had been looking at weren't really branches at all. They were antlers. My heart kind of relaxes. It's just a deer following me through the trees, no big deal. I take my eyes off of it. I turn backwards towards the path and take a couple of steps when I hear something behind me. Let me just say that what I had seen before was not a deer. It was now standing by the closest tree to my back in the right. It was basically on the path, but it was standing up like a human does. Its legs weren't human though. They looked more like a deer's legs with hooves. Its body almost looked like it could easily camouflage with a tree because it seemed very like frail. It looked like its limbs could have been branches because of how thin they were. It literally looked like part of the tree. The only thing that helped me realize that I wasn't looking at a tree other than its quick movement, were its eyes that seemed to glow kind of like an animal's eyes in the dark, and the weird deer skull that it was wearing on top of its face. As quickly as it appeared, it was gone. I didn't even have time to grab my pocket knife. I don't know if I trust my eyes, if I'm being completely honest. It all happened so fast. I took a summer job a few years ago in a town by my college. A local lodge wanted a housekeeper to clean the place and keep it tidy. Not too many people came in and out during the day, but it seemed to pick up at night. I didn't mind being alone, just pop on my headphones and get to cleaning, really. The lodge was three stories tall with the basement, however, they never instructed me to clean down there. Part of me figured it was just storage. But by the size of the building, I could surmise that the basement was pretty large. One day I was going about my normal routine, where I cleaned the top floors and worked my way down to the bottom. 
When I got to the first floor, I noticed the door down to the basement was wide open. I took my headphones out and called out thinking it's possible some other staff member went down there, or even the owners. The owners would come by frequently and grab boxes and bags from the basement. I called out asking if anyone was there, but I got no response. I don't know what came over me, but my curiosity got the best of me. It's not like I was suspicious of anything down there, I just wanted to take a look. There was a narrow staircase that led you down. I think I took about three steps before I heard someone call me. I gasped and turned quickly to see the owner. Immediately I apologized and explained that the door was open. He chuckled a bit and said, you're not in trouble, I'd be happy to give you a tour. He led me down the narrow staircase, and just as I suspected, the basement was huge. It wasn't your typical dark and dingy basement. To my surprise, it was super clean and well lit. A brick fireplace stood erect in the middle of the room, and boxes of holiday ornaments lay in the corner. The owner walked with me around to the corner where a vacant walk-in freezer remained. He explained that when his great-grandfather owned the building, it was once a prominent restaurant. He told me he didn't have the heart to tear any of it down when they built the lodge on top. After he was done giving me a tour, he led me upstairs. Nothing much to see down there, but it is a bit private, he said. Given what he told me about the basement and how it was essentially a shrine of the remains of his grandfather's prominent restaurant, I didn't question anything. He told me sometimes strong gusts of winds open the door, but if it ever happens again, just close it and go about my duties. I went about my task for the day but kept recalling the layout of the basement. The first thing that struck me as odd was the fact that there were no windows in the basement or any airflow. So how could gusts of wind prompt the door open? I recalled the walk-in freezer and wonder why they didn't put that one to use. There was one smaller one on the first floor, but the size of the one in the basement would fit so much more. My shift ended at 6 p.m and I had to put away all my cleaning supplies in the storage room on the first floor. I was on my way out when I noticed the basement door was open again. I went to close it, but I heard commotion coming from downstairs. I leaned it to see if I could hear voices, but only heard scuffling. On the off chance it was someone who wasn't supposed to be there, I didn't want to call out and alert them. I quickly and quietly tiptoed over to the supply room and grabbed a broom. It wasn't much, but it was the best weapon I had on hand. I approached the top of the spiral stairs and slowly descended. When I reached the bottom of the steps, I looked around cautiously and heard commotion coming from around the corner, where the freezer was. The closer I got, the louder it sounded. It was banging and coming from inside the freezer. I immediately opened it and stepped back, cocking my broom in the air. An elderly man burst out of the freezer gasping. Oh, thank you. I couldn't get the door open, he said. I dropped my broom and asked if he was okay. He was wobbling a bit when I reached out to grab him. His hands were ice cold. You're freezing, I told him, and I removed my jacket, placing it on him. He sighed in relief, thanking me while he caught his breath. I sat him down on this dusty chair and debated about turning the fireplace on. I was inspecting it, trying to flip it on, but it didn't seem to work. Oh, I could never get that old thing to work, he said. Customers didn't mind the cold season. I guess because the food is that good, he chuckled. I remembered the owner talking about the restaurant. Did you work at the restaurant, I asked? Work there? I owned it. He smiled and began glancing around, and his smile soon faded. Wait a minute. Where's the tables and chairs, he said angrily. I tried to calm him down, thinking he got confused and was an old worker who wandered in. I sat him back down and I told him that I'd get him a glass of water. I went up to the second floor and got a water bottle and I rushed back down into the basement. When I returned, there was no sign of him. My coat was left on the chair, but he wasn't. I looked around for a bit and figured maybe he caught his senses and left. I grabbed my coat and put away the chair and went back upstairs. I called it a night and went home. The next morning, I intended to tell the owner about the incident. When I arrived the following day, I noticed guests crowded in the lobby. Among them was the owner. When he caught sight of me, he waved me over. He apologized for forgetting to let me know that 
I didn't need to come in until later. I asked him why the people were gathered around, and he told me it was the anniversary of his grandfather's death. He went on about how he had passed away in this freak accident. I questioned how he passed, to which he replied that he got locked into the freezer. My stomach turned and my heart dropped. I glanced towards the basement knowing I had encountered his grandfather. I don't scare easy. Maybe that's my ego talking, but I like to think it's the truth. The military humbles you, but it also teaches you what you're capable of. It teaches when fear is and isn't appropriate. Three weeks ago, my fear was very appropriate. Unless I dreamt the entire day, there's no explanation for what I saw. There's at least no explanation that makes any sense. I've gone hunting every season since I retired from the military. That's 10 years now. Deer, boars, elk. I've been up and down the food chain. I eat what I kill. I'm not a trophy hunter. You might not even know I was a hunter if you just came by my place some random afternoon. I don't keep gun magazines on the coffee table. My gun closet is tucked away in the garage, safely away from the eyes and the hands of visitors. I don't talk about hunting. It's my personal time. Out there, away from civilization, with a rifle in my hands, it can be a comforting feeling. For better or for worse, the experience is calming, usually. Three weeks ago, calm was thrown out the window. I had recently moved my deer tower from its usual spot in the Okanagan Forest. I set it up about 30 kilometers northwest. My only motivation was the change in scenery. In hindsight, that might not have been a good enough reason. Something found me out there. Despite all the camouflage and the concealment, Something picked up my scent off the wind and came right to me. It hunted me like a fox on a hen. I was sitting in my little hen house, all warm and unprepared. It expected me to be an easy meal, I'm sure. If I'd been any less lucky that day, I probably would have been. I didn't hear it coming. That's embarrassing, but I really didn't. I only saw it when it breached the tree line and sulked into the clearing. It was massive. I thought at first it was a bear. Its fur was just too long, too thick and wild. When I aimed my gun in its direction, I saw the beast for what it was. A wolf, I think. A wolf larger than any animal I've ever seen in North America. It was looking at me and drooling. Starving, I could tell. I was shocked. I was appropriately afraid, I think. My rifle was not the caliber designed to take out animals of that magnitude. It kept coming toward the deer tower. I slid my finger onto the trigger, just in case I'd have to shoot to keep the beast moving. The base of my tower was ten feet off the ground. When that thing got close and stood on its hind legs, its front claws scraped the corner of the floor. I shot it. I shot it and it didn't flinch. It roared and sighed, almost annoyed and it mauled the tree tower itself. It could have jumped up there, I bet. It could have joined me in the box and had me cornered. I don't know why it didn't. Maybe it was just playing with me. Maybe I pissed it off and it wanted to piss me off right back. It tore through the legs in seconds. The next thing I knew, the entire structure was collapsing. The floor fell from beneath my feet and I went tumbling with it. I hit the ground hard. I lost my breath. Most of the tower collapsed right on the top of the wolf, or the dog, or bear, or whatever that thing was. I still don't know what it was. The weight of the tower knocked it down. It disoriented it. The bottle of dough urine I had with me busted open. The scent must have hit that animal like a whirlwind. It thrashed and splintered the remains of the stand and gave me just enough time to run. I made it to the tree line with my rifle in hand. I knew I couldn't outrun it. It was only a matter of time before it landed on my scent yet again. I turned around and used the side of a tree to steady my aim. I was still pretty shaken from the fall. I waited. I held my breath and I just waited. I watched this wolf thing rake its claws through the earth, searching for the source of the burning odor. When its paws came back up empty, it started to look around. I watched it as it stood up again and realized a horrifying truth. 
Its body just sat naturally upright as it did on all fours. It didn't struggle to hold its balance at all. It spotted me again. It huffed and it stepped toward me, this time walking on two legs. Luck found me again in that moment. If the wolf hadn't stood up, I would have been aiming at its shoulders and its back. On its hind legs, though, I could get to its stomach. I could get to somewhere important. When I fired this time, it yelped. I screamed with every ounce of air in my lungs. I screamed until I was empty. It must have been enough. I watched the wolf turn and flee in the other direction. I waited again. I knew I had to. I had to make sure that it wasn't circling around me, trying to approach me from the flank. It took me ten hours to make it back to my car. Every sound and movement put me on edge. I don't scare easy. I didn't used to anyway. The more time that passes between that encounter and now, the more I want to know what that animal was. I tell you one thing, though. I'm not willing to go back and get those answers. I'm built for a lot of things, but hunting that isn't one of them. I can take my rifle anywhere else in the world. That monster can have that forest. Hi, Donovan. I kind of hesitate to tell this story. I mean, police officers seem to get a bad rap, no matter what we do these days. I don't want to be known as some delusional city employee who imagines things, but I guess if I stay anonymous, it's fine. I work in law enforcement in a small city in Kansas. I've been on the force for a good 15 years. One morning, my partner and I responded to a call of a possible burglary in an older area of town not far from the station. We got there and scouted around the perimeter briefly before knocking on the front door. The elderly lady living there alone was terrified. She didn't open the door, but she stuck her head out of an upstairs window. She said she was too afraid to navigate through her house to open the front door for us. She told us where we can find the key hidden in her yard. As we were communicating with her, we kept looking around for any sign of trouble. There didn't appear to be any sign of a forced entry. The home had a front gate, and everything appeared secure. We got inside and did a quick walkthrough of the upstairs. The woman spoke with us from her bedroom doorway. She would only open the door halfway and said she was staying put in her room. We got her name and details. She told us that she had been sitting in her chair, when suddenly she started hearing banging on the interior door leading down into the garage. Many of the homes in that area are in a row house set up on each block. The garages are on the ground floor with the residents on the floor above. A lot of these houses have areas downstairs offset from the garage that are often used as in-law rental units. At this moment in my story, we had only checked out the upstairs residence and had not yet accessed the garage downstairs. She said she had initially gone downstairs, but the door handle started rattling. She described the banging as being incredibly loud, as if someone was kicking in the door, and the door handle was shaking violently. She became terrified at the thought that someone had gotten into the garage and was trying to break into her residence. She had called 911, and my partner and I showed up. When we had this info, we asked for another unit to begin making its way toward our location. We pulled out our weapons and flashlights and swept the upstairs area more thoroughly. We went downstairs to investigate the quarters on the lower level. We opened the door and descended into the dark downstairs. All the curtains were closed and barely any sunlight was getting in. When we got some lights on, it was like a time capsule in there. The entire downstairs area was like stepping into the 1970s. There was lots of dust, but otherwise perfectly preserved food and alcohol, books and magazines, and etc. When we stepped into the garage, we found that the automatic garage door was no longer operational, and a large old pristine Buick sat there looking like it never had left the lot. We found a closed door in the back, and it led us to an old unused in-law unit with vintage furniture and appliances. The place made us feel that we had totally stepped back in time. When we stepped into the unit's bedroom, it looked like someone had gotten up, walked out to do some errands, and never came back. 
There were some personal items, combs, brushes, makeup, and jewelry on the dresser. The closet was full of old suits, hats, and dresses. We searched in every conceivable place for a person to be hiding, and we could find nothing suspicious. All the entrances and windows were locked and secure. I'd been to many burglaries and many home invasions, and I've never seen a place with no sign at all of an intruder. There were no footprints, and the dust wasn't disturbed. There were framed black and white photos and documents on the walls. One of them was a headshot of the lady we had met upstairs. I took a closer look, and to the right of her photo, there was a frame containing a birth certificate and a death certificate. The woman's name was on both, the same name that belonged to the woman upstairs. Next to her photo was a framed photo of an elderly man, and also his birth and death certificates hanging on the wall. At that point, every hair on the back of my neck was standing straight up. When my partner saw the documents, we both just stared at each other, and then we ran back upstairs straight to the room where we had spoken to her. The door was closed, and when we knocked on it, she didn't open it. We went into the room, and it was completely empty. Nobody and nothing was in there, just an empty, old, dusty room. We looked everywhere and found no sign of anybody. At that point, we canceled the other responding unit and went back to the station. Come to find out, the woman and her husband had been murdered in that house 30 years prior. Her son had been unable to move on from the event and had left the house like some kind of museum. As my partner and I left the station later and got back into her car, he just said, I don't know, man. Do you believe in ghosts? That was pretty much the end of that conversation. But this incident really sticks with me. She had seemed completely real, flesh and blood. If she wasn't real, how could she call 911? How could we have stood and talked to her face to face? It all just seems impossible and makes me question everything. I was a volunteer firefighter for a tiny Midwestern town. We would do fire safety demonstrations at our local schools and certain companies in town, but we rarely had an emergency call. In fact, I only remember three fire calls in town over my 15 years on the job. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, we were a suburb of a decently large city, so that kept us busy. We got a call in the middle of the week, about 11 at night, that there was a fire at the new town hall. Luckily, no one was inside at the time, and the only thing lost was the building. Our town had just approved plans for a new town hall and had begun building only a month ago, so it wasn't finished yet. The lot for the new town hall wasn't exactly in town. There was a natural area with prairies and woods between the downtown and the suburbs. The new town hall was built on a flat area that backed up to a marshland. It was either that or they would have to clear a bunch of trees in a wooded area. The marsh was small and flooded sometimes in the spring, but the water never got anywhere close to the spot they were building on. One of the consequences of the town hall being there was that no one noticed it burning. There were no houses in the immediate area, but I heard there had been plans to clear the forest at some point and develop it. I doubt the plan is still in the works, though. The fire was called in by a young man driving home along the road. It couldn't have been more than 15 minutes from the time we got the call to when we arrived, but the building was completely destroyed already. We beat the sheriff there by a good 10 minutes. We got the fire out pretty quickly considering. I'd estimate it had been burning for quite a while before we arrived. The only thing salvageable from the building was the cement slab. The sheriff wanted to start an investigation. None of the wilderness areas around the building suffered any damage. It was localized to the town hall. There was no gas or electricity to the building yet, and the workers had been using portable generators. They kept the generators locked up in their trailers overnight, so that really wasn't a likely cause of the fire. We assumed it was likely arson, but there wasn't anyone in town that had any reason to burn down the new town hall. The vote for the new town hall passed unanimously. The building had just begun construction, so all the records were still being stored at the old town hall, which rules out anyone trying to destroy documents. It was a very strange case. This was the type of thing that happened in the city. 
not our small town, but it gets even stranger. The kid who had called it in stayed there and waited for the sheriff. He said he saw a man in a cape hanging around outside of the building when it was burning. He described the person about six feet tall and wearing what looked like to be a black cape. He couldn't see the face at all, but he said they had glowing red eyes. Both the sheriff and I looked at each other and tried to refrain from laughing. A man in a cape with glowing red eyes? Is Dracula our arsonist? I couldn't believe it. The sheriff asked the kid to take a drug test. He agreed and was still adamant that his story was true, that there was a man out there with glowing red eyes, and he last saw him heading towards the marsh. I helped the sheriff rope off the property with caution tape. He decided to start the investigation in the morning, when it was light out. As we were making our way around the back of the building, the sheriff noticed footprints in the dirt. I wouldn't have seen them in such dim lighting, but maybe that's why I'm not the county sheriff. I told him they were probably our footprints, since we had been around the outside of the building to put the fire out. But he stopped me and said, These definitely aren't yours. Maybe that kid did actually see somebody, but that begs the question, who on earth is out here in bare feet and dressed in a cape setting things on fire? The sheriff tried to get some photos, but they weren't showing up, even with the flash. We looked at the camera and it was just a blur. Now, I don't know what made both of us turn around and look towards the marsh, but we both did at the exact same time. I can't explain it, but it's like we both just knew something was out there. And something was, in fact, out there. I understood why the kid described the person as wearing a cape. If you didn't see him that well, you would have thought it would have been a long cape wrapped around his arms. But there was a full moon that night, and it gave the sheriff and I enough light to see that it was no cape. Those were wings. They were like bat wings, no feathers, and its eyes were definitely red. The sheriff yelled out to the creature, but as soon as he did, it disappeared into the marsh. He and I both stood there with our eyes fixed on the marsh for I don't know how long before I finally spoke. Are you going to go after it, I asked. The sheriff said, hell no. And that was the end of our conversation. The final results of the investigation were inconclusive, but I know that thing started the fire. I figure that must have been its land or something. The new town hall was moved to another area, and we never had any more problems. Hi Donovan, I'm a park ranger at Yosemite National Park. Let me start off by saying, we thought we were going to catch one. I mean, we almost caught one. I've been a ranger for seven years, and I've never experienced anything like this. This happened back in 2017. I was working the night shift at Tuolumne Meadows Campground during the summer. It was around 2 a.m. when I first saw what I believe was a Sasquatch. It was walking along the Tuolumne River, about 50 yards away from the campground. I was surprised by how large it was. It looked like a very large man with long dark hair and a full beard, but this creature walked in an odd way, almost like it had a limp or something was wrong with its leg. It seemed to favor its right leg as it walked along the riverbank. I watched it for several minutes as it made its way down river. Then it disappeared behind some trees and some bushes. I went back to the ranger station to grab my flashlight and camera, but when I returned outside, it was gone. I spent several minutes scanning the area with my flashlight, but I didn't see anything. After work that night, I reported what I saw to another ranger, who also worked at Tuolumne Meadows. He told me that he didn't see or hear anything unusual during his shift. He also said there's been no reports in this area the entire summer, so he really didn't believe me at first. But after hearing my story, he agreed to spend his next shift patrolling the area where I saw it. The next night, my fellow ranger ended up seeing it around the same time at night. Now, this was approximately 2.30 a.m. Maybe they are nocturnal, and that's why they avoid being seen. He saw it walking along the riverbank, and he also described it as limping. Well, that morning he walked along the riverbank and it was still sitting there, injured and moaning. 
He quickly returned to the ranger station and got his tranquilizer gun. When he returned, it was still there. Now, this was roughly 5 a.m. in the morning. He kept his distance and shot it with the tranquilizer gun. It was definitely angry when it got hit. It stood up and it took off into the woods. It was kind of moaning as it ran away, he said, but the tranquilizer really didn't seem to affect it. My colleague said he chased after it, but he lost sight of it in the trees. He returned to the ranger station and grabbed a spotlight to go back out looking for it, but he never found anything. Now, I've heard stories from other rangers about Sasquatches being seen at Yosemite National Park, but I finally saw one myself, and so did my fellow ranger. I know that we saw a Sasquatch. There's a state park in Illinois that has a whole slew of hidden canyons and caves and waterfalls. It's a strange place. You wouldn't think to find anything like it in the area, judging by the surrounding deciduous forests and flat and open fields. The park isn't terribly large either, but it is highly trafficked in the summer months. There is a campground and several cabins in the park that are usually rented out for months in advance. This is where I worked as a park ranger for six years. There is a long tragic history to this park, starting with two warring Native American tribes that lived in the area. I won't get into all of that here, but there have been some strange happenings in the park since the very start. A lot of people blame it on the native ghosts who died on the land. And while there may indeed be ghosts here, there is something else here as well. We would get reports from guests about animals damaging their property in the campgrounds and other strange things, like tents being unzipped in the middle of the night and things moving around. There is even one instance where rocks from a fire pit were placed in a circle around the tent of a guest that was staying there. Even more confounding was the fact that they had put out the fire late in the evening, so the rocks were undoubtedly extremely hot. The complaints that we would get from cabin guests were that something was knocking on the doors, scraping on the walls and tapping on the window glass. It was all weird, but mostly harmless stuff. At least harmless in that no one was physically injured. If someone left anything outside unsecured though, it could likely be moved. But then it gets weird. First, I should explain to you a little bit about the layout of the park. There are several canyons, and most of them are box canyons with no way out. You have to hike in and then turn around and hike out. Most of these canyons have waterfalls of some sort. Depending on the season, the waterfalls can range from a steady supply of water to just a trickle. There are usually stagnant pools of water at the base of the canyons. The waters there are a beautiful bluish green, gorgeous in photos, but I definitely wouldn't go swimming in them. A few times a year, we would get reports of hikers seeing creatures in these bluish green pools or hearing a voice telling them to go in. Often, they would report that it was the voice of someone they knew, but the person wasn't there. It was super weird stuff. There wasn't a whole lot we could tell them other than not to go in the pools and keep themselves alert. Like I said, it only happened a few times a year, but it did happen year after year. Most of the reports were the same three locations in the park. One particular summer, it was extremely hot and we didn't have much rainfall. The pools were shrinking, but we were getting higher than normal reports from hikers. Now, none of the reports were incredibly detailed. I think it was because people didn't want us to think they were crazy. Most of the time, they would just say they saw something strange in the canyon or on the trail or hear something strange. And then they would let us know that we should probably check it out. After the fifth report that summer, I started doing some digging myself. I pulled up all the reports from the last 10 years and marked their location on a map. I don't know why no one had dug into this before, but I found that the locations were all relatively close to the caves. There was only one thing they had in common. There is a pretty extensive cave system throughout the canyons, but I'm not sure if it has been explored in detail, or at least it hasn't been mapped out recently. Judging from the map, 
There was a possibility that the caves could be interconnected, but I wasn't certain. There was one canyon, however, that seemed to have the most action, and right next to it were three large caves. So one day, I made an excuse about needing to head to that area so I could test my theory. I parked my vehicle at the trailhead and hiked in about six miles to the first canyon. There were what looked like fish bones along the edge of the pool at the end of the canyon. Now, this was rather strange. I didn't think fish would be able to survive an environment like that, but at least I didn't see any creatures, nor did I hear any strange voices. I set out on my mission to explore inside the caves. I brought a handheld flashlight and a headlamp and a rope to tie a tree outside the cave so I wouldn't get lost if the cave had multiple chambers. I headed into the largest cave first. I didn't find anything strange at the entrance, but quickly I realized how I made such a huge mistake. I followed the cave for what felt like an eternity, although I'm sure it was only a few minutes. I heard something move in the distance, and I shined my light on it. I couldn't see what it was, but it looked like there was a nest of some sort in the cave. It looked like a bird's nest, but it was so large that it could have fit a human. It was lined with fresh leaves and grass. There were bones scattered around the outside of the nest. There were no animals that I knew of that made any nest like that. I pulled on the rope to help me find my way back out to find that it was slack. I tried to pull the slack out, but it was never ending. I then realized that my rope had either been cut or untied. All of a sudden, the air felt thin. It was hard to breathe. I did my best not to panic. I hurried out of the cave as quickly as I could, and by some miracle, I made it outside. I took a quick look around, but I didn't see anything. Yet, someone out there had released my rope. Sure enough, when I got to the tree where I had tied it, there was nothing there, but something had obviously untied it. I knew I needed to leave. I didn't know what was out there, but I just knew I had to get far away, and fast. I turned back to give it all one last look, and that's when I saw it. Although only for a moment, it was crouched down near the entrance of the cave, just beyond the light. It looked ghostly. I don't know how else to describe it. It was like a human, but it wasn't a human. It had no hair on its body, and it was so pale, it was nearly pure white, like something that had never seen the sunlight. Its eyes were huge for the size of its head, and I didn't see much of a nose. I ran nearly the entire six miles back to the truck, and I never went to that place alone again. I appreciate the chance to tell this story. When I was working as a ranger for the park service, there were stretches of time when I would be working remotely on my own. This was especially true when I was working at a state park in Wyoming. I was sometimes out for a week or two at a time, living out of my RV and collecting field data. I didn't typically encounter much out of the ordinary, except for one time when I was out in the mountains in southern Wyoming. I was off the main road by a couple of miles. I was camped at the edge of a clearing. The open meadow was to the north. There was a thick forest to the east, west, and south. Before sundown, I went into the woods to the east to gather some wood. That area didn't tend to draw many people, since the roads are rough and it's kind of a local gem that not many people know about, so it seemed odd when I came upon some sort of structure made from downed trees. The trees were aspen, and they were formed into the structure that was kind of a mix between a teepee and a lean-to. There were a lot of carvings cut into the aspen trees all around the structure. It was actually pretty cool. The structure was probably about 20 feet high. The carvings were strange. It wasn't like letters or numbers that I could make out. They mostly seemed like primitive shapes. Seeing this out in a rarely visited location did make me feel kind of cautious, wondering if something else was around. It was quite close to where I was setting up camp, but I wasn't really worried. I got what wood I could find easily, 
and went back to build my fire. Usually my campfire dinners were pretty boring, but that time I had my RV fridge stocked with some good steaks. So I grilled one up with some potatoes and it smelled incredibly good. After dinner, I read for a while and then I went to bed and fell asleep pretty fast. It was probably only about an hour or so later when I woke up to some noise. It sounded like a small animal scurrying around the campsite. I wasn't too worried. I was kind of wondering if the smell of my dinner might have attracted something. I banged on the wall of the RV and it sounded like the animal ran off. I settled into my blankets and was drifting off when I was suddenly ripped into full consciousness by this loud whooping noise. I laid there staring up at the ceiling, listening as the sound kept repeating itself. It would start low and guttural and then it would get higher and incredibly loud and then it would end abruptly before repeating. I have heard a lot of things, but I'd never heard that particular kind of call before. It definitely sounded like a call that an animal would use to communicate with. My side window was popped open so I could hear it clearly through the screen. I sat there thinking about it and estimated that it was coming from the direction where the structure was. I lifted the blinds a little and looked through the screen. The moon was bright and I could see someone wobbling around at the edge of the trees. I'd say it was about 40 or 50 feet away from me. I couldn't see well at all, but it didn't seem like an animal since it was walking upright. Now this was miles from a town, and there were no campgrounds nearby at all. I looked at my watch and it was 1 a.m. So someone is walking around the forest at 1 a.m. during a weekday? I sat back and watched it lumbering around. It was right near the teepee structure. Then it seemed to lean against a tree and squat down like it was using the tree for a backrest. I started getting this whiff of urine smell and it kept getting stronger. Whoever it was was facing right towards me and it wasn't moving. It was just sitting there. I sat still for five minutes and didn't move. I didn't shuffle around, nothing. I was completely still. I couldn't relax not knowing what it was. So I grabbed my mag light and stepped out of the RV. I turned on my light to shine it towards the trees, and the thing stood up. I was basically screaming, oh shit, in my head. That thing had to be close to eight feet tall. It was like a huge ape, and it looked right at me with these reddish eyes. It sure as hell wasn't anything from the list of Wyoming wildlife, I'll tell you that right now. It had really shaggy light brown hair with just a massive upper body and like a cone-shaped head. It lifted its head to make that whooping sound again, and I could see that its face seemed mostly hairless. My adrenaline was rushing, and all I wanted to do was get behind the wheel and drive away. I ran towards the driver's side door and realized I had left my keys inside the RV. I had to go back there and get them, and I was terrified that that thing would come at me and reach me in no time at all but it stayed where it was and kept howling. As I pulled away, the headlights hit the tree line, and I saw it retreat further back into the woods. I didn't waste any time getting out of there. I left half my belongings at the campsite, but I didn't care at all. Like I said, that was the one and only time I spotted something unexplainable, which really actually surprises me, considering how much time I spend in the wilderness. I was on the police force in Minnesota for about 12 years. The town I was in was so far north, it was basically Canada. Summers were short and humid. Winters were absolutely brutal. In fact, most of the incidents I had to respond to in the winter months were related to bad road conditions in one way or another. This incident happened in the fall of 2010. It was cold, I remember but there were only a couple of inches of snow on the ground at the time. I was called in to investigate a case of property damage at a homestead deep in the woods. The report came in early that morning and said there was significant damage to the woodshed. I asked if it looked like the perpetrator was an animal, in which case it would be a job for animal control instead, but the caller said there were footprints left behind. I cleared my schedule so I could head out there right away. If there were footprints, I could get a size and a tread pattern. 
but I had to move quickly because as soon as the sun came up, it would start to melt the prints and they would get distorted beyond use. The homestead was an off-grid cabin set up in a deep pine forest. You couldn't see it from the road. In fact, you could barely see the driveway. The only reason I found the place was the lone mailbox at the end of the road. I didn't even see a fire number. I'll be honest, the guy who lived here was a bit odd. You have to be to live in this climate without electricity. He said he spent the last three days chopping wood for the winter, as he was a little behind this year. The woodshed was located about 50 yards away from the house. The man claimed he heard an animal moving around out there for the last two days, but he never saw anything. He thought now that it might have been a person who did the damage to the woodshed, but it didn't make much sense as to why someone would have any reason to attack a building. And it looked like an attack, like something you would expect from a bear. One whole side of the shed was torn off and scattered across the ground. Logs from the shed were strewn all over the property, and I mean all over the property. There were logs up near the house and just all over for as far as you could see. The man said he woke up in the night to the sound of a destruction outside, and he opened his door to take a look at what was going on. He claimed to see the back of a man who looked to be dressed in a white fur coat. As soon as he opened the door, he said the man ran into the woods. He waited until morning to investigate the damage, and that's when he found the footprints. But here's the strange part. The prints were that of bare feet. I didn't believe him until he showed me. They were definitely human footprints, although quite large. But that could be explained by the sun. When the sun hits footprints, they melt and get larger. I took photos of the footprints and walked around the perimeter of the shed to record the damage. As I was walking around the back side, I saw a white blur out of the corner of my eye. I spun around to get a better look. The only thing I saw was white fur running into the forest. This must be our guy, I thought, so I chased him. I didn't realize until I was maybe 80 yards into the pine forest that I wasn't chasing a man at all. It looked like a man from behind, about my height and running on two legs. But it was not a man at all. It stopped to face me. It had an ape-like face. The skin around its face and hands were sort of a brownish tan, and the rest of the creature was covered in white hair. I drew my gun because I thought it was going to attack me when it stopped running, but it just stood there, panting like it was out of breath. I looked down at its feet. No shoes. This was definitely the creature that destroyed the shed. I don't know what I was thinking, but I tried talking to it. But it was obvious I didn't have any understanding of language. I still had my gun drawn on it. I slowly reached into my pocket to grab my phone to get a picture of this thing. But it ran, and I didn't follow it that time. My encounter with the creature only lasted a max of a few seconds, but it felt longer than that. I couldn't believe what I had seen, and I had no idea what I was going to tell the man who owned the cabin. I couldn't put any of this in the police report. I'd probably get fired for suspicions of insanity. I couldn't tell the guy it was an animal either, since he saw human footprints out there. I decided to protect my own ass and not say anything. I took down the report of the property damage, and that was it. I did stay to help the man clean up the logs that had been scattered across the property. I don't know exactly why, as I had a bunch of other things I was supposed to do that day. I guess I felt guilty for not telling him about the creature in his woods. I did check up on the man again in a few weeks. When I got there, the first thing I noticed is that the woodshed had been moved right next to the house. I asked about it, and he said the same thing happened about two weeks later. He said he saw something out there in the woods, but I wouldn't believe him if he told me the truth. Since he moved the shed away from the forest, he hadn't had any issues, and hopefully it would stay that way. I was a Wyoming State Patrol officer for 16 years. I've seen my share of strange situations, but nothing that couldn't be explained away when I had all the details. However, I had an incident in the winter of 2012 that I'll never forget. 
dispatch, send me out to the scene of a vehicle collision with a potential wolf. I say potential wolf because although we have a healthy wolf population in the area, they are very rarely ever seen. Most people see a large coyote or a dog and assume it's a wolf. From the little information I was given, I knew it was just one vehicle involved, one driver with mild, non-life-threatening injuries. The ambulance had already arrived at the scene, so I didn't rush over there. There was a light dusting of snow on the roads. It wasn't much, but it was enough to make for slippery conditions. In fact, I expected that was probably a factor in this accident, just as much as the wolf was. When I arrived on the scene, the driver was being treated for some superficial injuries. He was a white male in his mid-40s. He didn't appear to be under the influence of any drugs or alcohol. His car, an older model Ford Ranger, was pulled off on the shoulder of the road. It was completely totaled. The front end was destroyed. Both airbags had gone off, the windshield was broken, and the hood of the truck was basically folded in half. I walked over to the ambulance to talk to the driver. I couldn't believe he had escaped with so few injuries, considering the state of his car. So dispatch told me you hit a wolf, I said. The driver nodded. Are you sure it wasn't a moose? I'm not sure a wolf could cause that kind of damage to your truck. The driver just looked at me and said, it was a wolf. He didn't seem to want to tell me much else. So I decided to take photos of the scene and file my report before coming back to see if I could get the rest of his story. The snow was fresh enough that I could get a decent idea of what happened. There were a few other tire tracks on the road, but I could see just where the impact happened. Considering the damage to the truck, I was certain this was not a wolf he hit. A big gray wolf in the area is maybe 150 pounds max. There was just no way it could have wrecked the truck like that. I've seen the aftermath of vehicle collisions with a moose that had less damage. A collision with something like a moose often causes significant injury or death to the occupants in the car. The fact that this guy was relatively unharmed was a miracle. I looked for tracks coming up the ditch and into the road to see if I could verify what kind of animal it actually was. I found a trail but the snow was too deep to see what kind of footprints were down there. The animal tracks on the road were erased by vehicle tracks, so that wasn't much help either. I went to the other side of the road to see if I could find any signs of the animal. I couldn't imagine it got too far after taking a hit like that. Normally, I would just write down in my report that there was a vehicle collision with an animal and go about the rest of my shift. But something about this story bothered me, and I wanted to get to the truth. I found a trail leading from the crash site into the forest. There were a few specks of blood in the snow, but nothing substantial. I couldn't see the prints due to the depth of the snow, but there was obviously a path that the creature took away from the scene. I followed it to the edge of the forest, but then the driver of the totaled ranger came running out of the ambulance to stop me. Don't follow it, he yelled. It wasn't a normal wolf, it was something else. I finally sat down with the driver and got his story. He didn't want to say anything at first because it sounded too crazy. He said the animal he hit was a wolf, but it was larger than any wolf he had ever seen. The word he used to describe it was prehistoric, like it was from a time where animals were all giants, but he said it was for sure a wolf. He didn't see it in the road at first because it was entirely white and nearly invisible against the snow. The only thing he saw was its amber eyes, but by then it was too late. He said he hit the creature dead on. He said it rolled across the road towards the ditch, but then it got up, shook off, and ran into the woods almost like nothing happened. I didn't really believe his story, but I did put collision with gigantic wolf down in my report. The EMT said they were going to take the driver to the hospital to make sure he didn't have any trauma to his brain. And after hearing his tale, I thought that was a good idea. I had to stay at the scene and wait for the tow truck. They were about 30 minutes out. So I decided to continue looking for the body of this wolf. I examined the vehicle further and found a few bits of hair stuck up in the engine compartment. They were white. Maybe this guy's story had some truth to it. I followed the tracks towards the woods where they suddenly vanished. 
the sun was starting to set, so I didn't have the visibility, but that trail completely disappeared with nowhere to go. It was like the creature that made them just suddenly stopped existing. I mean, completely vanished. I looked around everywhere, and I couldn't find anything. That is, until I noticed scratches on the trunk of one of the trees. There were huge claw marks on one of the larger trees, and a few flecks of blood in the snow at the base of the tree. I know wolves don't climb trees. I can't tell you how afraid I was to look up, but I knew I had to. I shined my flashlight towards the sky, and there, in the dark, were two amber eyes looking down at me. It had the face of a wolf, but it wasn't like any wolf I had ever seen. The driver's description was accurate. The creature was pure white and absolutely gigantic. I was surprised that the tree was even supporting it. I drew my gun, but I couldn't justify shooting it. The creature wasn't attacking me. In fact, it looked like it was trying to hide. I walked backwards towards the road, never taking my eyes off the animal. I could barely see it when I reached the road. Its white hair was the perfect camouflage. However, I was certain it could still see me. It likely had been watching us the entire time. From what I could tell, it stayed in the tree until after we left the scene. I don't know what exactly it was. I never saw the creature again, but I didn't expect to. I'm sure there are more of them out there, but they seem to do a good job of staying hidden. But every once in a while, someone has an encounter with something that they can't explain. They're out there. I think they just don't want to be found. That night was terrifying, and it changed me, I think. When you see something like that, something that you cannot explain no matter how hard you try, no one believes you, and sometimes you don't know what to believe either, but you are certain what your eyes had seen. It's an awful feeling, so I don't ever talk about it anymore. You don't want people to think you're crazy or easily influenced. You don't want to seem gullible, so I don't know what to think. You start to feel crazy. That night, I was training. I was a deputy in training. I was new, so in a lot of ways, that night was already very hard. I had so many new responsibilities. I had to really be top notch, not only for my own safety, but for the safety of others. And that was a heavy burden to bear. At the time, it felt exhilarating and exciting, but I later realized that it was too much. Too much to be in charge when something that is out of your control happens. I remember vividly that we were sent to a diner. It was one of those pit stop places. It had a small gas station connected to it. There had been a complaint about a man in hysterics who had been disturbing the customers. One of the restaurant staff had fixed him a cup of coffee. He seemed like he was in better shape based on what we were told. The man was really shaken up. He appeared to have been crying a bit. He claimed that something had taken his dog. Not someone, something. Let me make that clear. As soon as we started talking to him, he fell back in his hysteria. He was speaking gibberish. Something about lights, something about the sky. That was about all we were able to get out of him at the time. My commanding officer had decided that it might be best if we took him with us to the station. We weren't sure who this man was. He had no identification. And we weren't sure if he was intoxicated or under the influence of illegal drugs. And then there was the question of his sanity. By his appearance, he looked like he hadn't bathed in days. His hair looked very dirty and so were his hands and face. Honestly, I pegged him for a drunk man with nowhere to be. He didn't seem to be in his right state of mind. He seemed very crazy. It was a lot. I really felt bad for him. But at the same time, I felt very disgusted by him. I feel horrible for saying that. I just kept thinking, how do people end up this way? But we got him into our vehicle and we started driving towards the station. The man was muttering in the back of the squad car, but eventually fell silent. The area we were in was very small. It was a small town. It felt very desolate. It would take us a good 45 minutes or so to get back to the sheriff's office. So we're driving along the road and I start to look out towards the sky. It was nearing dusk and I just remember thinking that I wanted to get out of the car and go home for the night 
because the man smelt very foul. But I just kept on gazing out the window. I didn't want to show how I was feeling. I felt guilty about my thoughts, really. At some point, I start to notice a really weird glowing light in the sky. It looked like a small fireball. It was round, in a way, but it looked like it had a trail coming off the back of it. And it was moving in the sky in a very unusual way. It didn't go in one direction. It went several directions, side up, side to side, up and down, diagonal at times. I hadn't seen anything like it before. It looked like it was dancing, sort of. And then the ball separated into two balls, and then into three balls, and then back into one ball. It was nuts. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So I alerted my commanding officer, and that sent the unknown man off. Once he saw the thing in the sky, he began throwing himself around the car because he was trying desperately to get out of the vehicle. And just as quickly as the ball appeared, it was gone. I started to feel very sick. I had the chills, and I felt very fatigued. It was like I had a fever almost. My commanding officer seemed frantic at this point. I think they were upset about what all transpired. Mostly I think me getting sick was the tipping point for them. I'm not sure if they felt stressed because they didn't think I was able to handle the pressure, so it left a weight on them. But the rest of the night was awful. Eventually I fainted, just completely blocked out. I don't remember getting to the station, I just remember being helped out of the car. And I was sent home to recover. I'm not sure what happened to the man, I decided to resign the following day. Between the shock of everything and the treatment I received that night, I just wanted to clean the slate. I'm not sure what the other officer had seen, or if they'd seen anything at all. It just felt very judgmental, the treatment I had received. It felt like everyone was looking at me like I was crazy drunk, like I was creating a scene and making people uncomfortable. Maybe it was karma, maybe I was getting a taste of my own medicine, but I was terrified. 